When we look at Genesis 5, we see the awful consequences of sin in each generation. Because as we're told the names of um, the fathers in each generation, there is a discouraging similarity in the record of, of their life. And the similarity we see in chapter 5, verse 5. All the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. We see in verse 8 about Seth, and he died. We see in verse 11 about Enosh, and he died. In verse 14 about Kenan, and he died. Every place we see, and he died, and he died, and he died. We read a biography of someone who lived a long time ago. Maybe we don't know how the biography begins, but we know how the biography ends. We know that we'll be told of his death, and we'll be, we know we'll be told of the circumstances around his death or her death, what happened on the day she died or he died. But in, in the seventh generation, in Genesis 5, verse 22 and to 24, we see that Enoch walked with God, verse 22, that he lived 365 years, verse 23. But verse 24 says he walked with God and he was not for God took him. We don't see the words and he died. This is an exception. Why? Well, I think it's a pattern. It's a pattern of the experience of those who will be alive when Christ comes. The general principle, the nearly universally, the nearly universal principle we see in Hebrews 9, it is appointed for a man once to die. And then comes the judgment. In August 1994, I watched my father die. Uh, I was with him when he died. I was looking at his face when he died. I actually was present when he opened his eyes for the last time. I was the only person in the room when he opened his eyes for the last time. And as I watched my father die, I kept thinking, this is a debt that every man and woman will pay. This is a debt to Adam. This is a debt we received from Adam because of sin. And yet, those who are alive when Christ comes will not die. Obviously, some Christians believe that the church will be taken out of the world before the tribulation begins. If this way of interpreting prophecy is true, we may say that Enoch is a type or a pattern of what will happen at the rapture. But no matter what we believe about prophecy, all Christians, or nearly all Christians, believe that uh, those who are living on the earth when Christ dies, or when Christ comes again, will escape death and will not taste of death themselves. Now, in a way, it's a reward, but I don't think that Enoch was more righteous than any person who ever lived, and those righteous people died. Daniel died and Joseph died. They were certainly righteous people. They certainly were people who walked with God. I think more than a reward, it is a pattern of something that God is going to do. It also shows that God has the power to overcome death. And now, let me say this, and again, I hesitate to introduce these other ideas, but when you hear this passage preached on, or when you read books about Genesis 5, you may see the suggestion that Enoch could be one of the two witnesses. When you get to the end of the Bible in Revelation 11, there are two witnesses, two supernatural personalities whom God sends to the earth. They are not named. They are killed. Some people believe that those two witnesses will be Enoch and Elijah because Enoch and Elijah are the only two people who were ever born on this planet who did not die. But some people believe that they'll get their chance to die in a later generation, in the last generation. 
in the generation of Revelation 11. I don't know if that's true or not. It doesn't have to be true. But Enoch and Elijah are two examples in the Old Testament of men whom God spares death. Now, we're told a very important spiritual reality is introduced in the life of Enoch in Genesis 5. We're told that he walked with God. Genesis 5, 24. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. This is a principle that we see taught by Jesus in, in John 15, that we are to abide in Christ. This is a principle that we see taught by Paul in Galatians 5, that we are to walk in the Spirit, that we're to walk where God walks, that we're to walk as God walks, that we're to walk in the way that God tells us to walk, that we are to walk with God. Enoch is our first pattern of that, a, a godly, godly man who walked with God. There's a famous preacher who liked to tell the story that every day, it, this is a little bit sentimental, it's a little bit corny, but he, he told the story that uh, every day Enoch would walk with God. God would come and Enoch would walk with him. And this went on for years and years and years and years. And one day they walked a long way and God said to him, Enoch, you know we're actually closer to my house now than to your house. We've walked such a long way. So why don't you just come home with me? And I pray that each of our deaths will be like that. We probably will not escape death unless we're alive when Jesus comes. Uh, I'm the oldest person in the room. I have less chance of escaping death than you. You may be alive when the Lord Jesus comes. You may have the opportunity to share this experience of Enoch, uh, of, with Enoch of escaping death. But I want to tell you one more little thing. Let's don't long to be alive at the coming of Christ for the wrong reasons. This great preacher Spurgeon that I keep talking about, who died in 1892, he said he did not want to be alive when Christ came because he said he did not want to go through eternity having missed the fellowship with Christ in death. He said that death was something his Savior experienced and he wanted that same fellowship with Christ, that when he goes through eternity, he wants the knowledge that he shared death, that fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So death is not a thing to be feared. Death is not a thing to be dreaded if we know Christ. Jesus says to Mary, uh, to Martha in John eleven twenty five, 25, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never die. Your experience of death will be different than the experience of the unbeliever. It won't be death to you. It will be a doorway. It will be going from, from death to life. And it will be going from life little l to life capital L. So it's nothing to be dreaded. But we do have this wonderful picture in chapter 5. In chapter 5, this great man called Noah is born. I think I indicated in the last lecture that Methuselah was, was listed as the father of Noah. He's actually listed as the grandfather of Noah. But remember, there can be gaps. We're not necessarily told every name. And we do have some problems to resolve with numbers. Um, there was a man who happened to be a Seventh-day Adventist who was a wonderful scholar who studied at the University of Chicago in America. His name was Edwin Thiele, if you can ever get your hands on his book, T-H-I-E-L-E. -E. He devoted a great deal of his life to resolving these problems with the numbers in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, in terms of the age and exactly what the original manuscript said and how we resolve the difficulties. The book he wrote was called The Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings the mysterious numbers of the Hebrew kings. Um, we see by the end of verse 32, that by the end of chapter 5, verse 32, that Noah was 500 years old and Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, 
please visit tbsseminary.com.